All right, we are here with Quantum Speed, and I'm starting with a story I just saw this morning, which is very interesting. This guy named Bill Dear Damir Cappy um, hmm, has already apparently nuked the tweet he put up this morning. But anyway, he, um, he put up a tweet yesterday with reports from Mandiant explaining exactly what happened with that famous breach, the Okta breach, and they were very interesting, showing exactly on what date they did that, like these guys would get a shell and then they would immediately open Bing and search for like um, uh, Mimi Catch and download it and go there and then they go to the next one, open Bing and search for Mimi Catch again. So just like you think, they're relatively low skills. So anyway, he published these obviously confidential reports from Mandiant. And then, like a couple hours later, he said, well, uh, this is not what I expected. I just got fired from Zoom for doing that. And then everybody started screaming and yelling and complaining about uh, whether he should have got fired or not. I thought, and then I went and looked at his blog. And I, this guy is so much like me. <laughs> he does, I, used to, I did this stuff too. He, he said, I didn't get that stuff from Zoom. I got it from another source. So it's been my personal account. So they shouldn't fire me for it. And he said, I need a lawyer to sue. And I said, you know, uh, I've been through all this crap. Just forget the lawyer, forget the lawsuit, get another job. <laughs> but you should be able to get another job. And anyway, I went in his blog. His blog is great. He's done all this interesting stuff. And the one thing that I really loved was a couple of years ago, he was in Cyber Patriot. And so, of course, he reverse engineered the Cyber Patriot scoring system and found that Cyber Patriot has Cyber Patriot is an Air Force cybersecurity game for high school students. It has all the answers right in the Cyber Patriot image, which it decrypts with something you can like a reverse engineer. So he wrote a reverse engineer so you can steal all the secrets and cheat and published it. And then the Cyber Patriot said, so, uh, guys, will you, will you please take that down until we patch it? So he took it down for a month. Anyway, and a lot of really good research here. So I think he'll be fine. But everyone is discussing, you know, should he have been fired? Is this OK? Is this not OK? Um, and I, I saw a lot of comments from Leslie Carhart and others on this. Uh, Leslie Carhart's taken the position that Zoom really shouldn't be doing this. It's ugly. It's not covered by the NDA. But later on, there's a guy who's sort of a fascist like me that says, you know, uh, if you work for a company and you embarrass Mandiant, that's bad for business. Um, they really need him to like take down those tweets or something. And uh, anyway, I'm interested to see both sides of it. Because I remember when I did something outrageous like this, I, I took his position. I'm going to sue. I have every right to do this. And when I finally got a lawyer, he sort of said, well, you know, what you did there was not like 100% good or 100% legal. And maybe you shouldn't take this high handed attitude that you're all right. And the other people are all wrong. <laughs> and uh, it would probably be better to just move on, which is what I ultimately did. So anyway, uh, the fact that those tweets have vanished in the last hour or so makes me think that he probably did get a job and, they, and he agreed to take down the tweets. But the report from Mandiant was interesting to see, and now it's out there. I'm sure there are copies. Anyway, that's the latest cybersecurity storm in a teapot I've seen. And Caitlin has the all-important app that attends Zoom meetings for you. Yes, so it's finally here. It's the Bueller app. So Forbes has an article written by Gene Marks talking about this new app called Bueller. And it sends a virtual avatar to your Zoom meetings for you. So you no longer have to be stuck in Zoom meetings all day. But people, you know, our prayers have finally been answered. But people can see the avatar. It's not just a video of you sitting here looking bored, which would fool them. Right, right. So, and they're, they're claiming this is, you know, going to be the future of meetings where you sort of, if you don't need to attend in person, you can send in your avatar that'll record everything and you know, it's, it's, they're like, it's legit, you know? And, and so finally, we, I know so many people have been complaining about Zoom meetings and everything over the pandemic. We finally have a solution. Well, you know, my corporate customers are incredibly intelligent. They're busy. When we have meetings, they're like five minutes long. They say, okay, we've resolved, we're quitting. It's only colleges that have meetings that go on and on for hours is zero content, as far as I can tell. Yeah, one of the, one of the skills that you should learn when you go into business or or anything outside of a college is to be very comfortable if you schedule a meeting for an hour and it only takes you 10 minutes just be like okay we're done early bye yeah there should be an agenda you should be there to accomplish something when you accomplish it you're done this does not happen at colleges the whole purpose of meetings is to fill the time so they can report yes we had a meeting yes i think yeah. it's, it's it's like 100 filibuster and no business exactly so yeah. If you're stuck in that situation, there's now an app that can help you. So, 
well, now we're going to take a dive into dangerous, disturbing territory that will probably get us banned. Alan has more science about COVID. Uh, more science about COVID, indeed, and uh, more encouragement to get ivermectin treatments because oh, it turns out that getting a fourth dose of the COVID vaccine, while somewhat helpful, we're, we're really starting to see diminishing returns in terms of vaccine efficacy at this point. A couple of studies coming out of Israel, uh, both of them are small and they are non-randomized trials. So uh, these are not representative groups of people. They're just uh, healthcare workers, for example, who happen to be working at a certain hospital that received uh, fourth doses of the Pfizer vaccine uh, some months ago when Israel started uh, distributing fourth doses to healthcare workers and the elderly. And it turns out that while there are indeed some benefits initially upon vaccination, um, and this is measured by um, antigens or uh, rather antibodies in the um, in blood samples, that eventually that really tapers off and very quickly. So uh, it peaks after about three weeks in which we, you have a, a vaccine efficacy of about 64%. And then at the end of 10 weeks, it's already down to 29.2%. And this is efficacy in terms of protection from infection, not protection from severe illness and death. Uh, to be very clear, these vaccines are still very effective in protecting against death. Um, however, it's, it is also becoming very clear that they don't do a whole lot now in terms of protecting from infection. Now, a few more caveats, these are healthcare workers. And so they are exposed to a lot more sick people and probably in much higher doses. So if you're just the average person out and about, you're not spending time in an office, you are just going to the store, um, you're running errands, you're walking around, you're probably not going to be exposed to as many sick people and is in high doses. So perhaps uh, you would be somewhat less um, vulnerable, but um, it doesn't change the fact that fourth doses of the vaccine and presumably fifth and sixth and seventh also demonstrate this uh, really declining efficacy from uh, symptomatic infection. Yeah, well, I'm gonna get it anyway, of course, but I think this is a question of the, uh the the commons for individual people it would be better to get the dose probably as a matter of grand public policy it's not really worth the money the government spending the money to distribute the fourth dose right well i think it depends on the costs of uh, subsequent infections yeah uh, we but know, the point is you're not preventing that many more infections obviously well this is true this is true but uh any reduction might be helpful you know if, if we're talking about a population of 300 uh, plus million uh, in the case of the U.S. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, certainly from my point of view, any benefit is worth getting. Yeah. And the one yeah. part I liked about this is they said there are no significant increased side effects, so there's no downside. Yes, and, and that's another important point, too, is that they found that there aren't any real negatives or drawbacks to getting yeah. the vaccine, so you might as well do it. And, and, the, that you can't and the second study here suggests that you get like another 10 or 12 weeks of like protection from infection, which is not nothing. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And especially as it seems like we're uh, entering into another increase in the number of infections. It seems Well, like now everybody's going harder. back to work, taking off their masks and all that. So it would be a good idea to get another 10 or 12 weeks of protection about now. That's right. Yeah. And, and I mean, a lot of this, uh, a lot of these peaks and valleys in terms of uh, epidemic spread are driven by not vaccination, but by other non-pharmaceutical in interventions that people may or may not be undertaking, like wearing masks or changing their behavior. Yeah, I read one of the CDC scientists who said, you know, it's really time that we keep giving doses of the old one from like two years ago and start having a new one tailored to the new variants, which sounds pretty logical. It does, except a few studies now have shown that tailored vaccines specific to Omicron don't show any better uh, efficacy than the original wild type vaccine. Yes, I saw that. And so, I mean, this is better than nothing, and it's all we have. But presumably, in the future, we're going to have to have like an annual booster, like a flu shot or something. 
Right, or an entirely different type of vaccine, like a nasal spray that works much differently. Oh, would I assumed they would all be the same once they got in your body, but I guess I don't know. Yeah, well, there, there are uh, all the vaccines currently use focus on the protein spike yeah. that the virus used to, uses to bind to human cells. Mm -hmm. But there are apparently other efforts underway to uh, target other parts of the coronavirus cell. Oh. Um, and so the, the, the holy grail would be a vaccine that targets not just the coronavirus uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus, but other coronaviruses also. Yeah, I saw and, one of them where it's like a buckyball with like eight different things it attacks. Exactly, exactly. And um, I've talked about this on this podcast before that the, uh, um, uh, the, uh, the uh, U.S. military is working on a pan-coronavirus vaccine. Um, and other organizations too, but that's going to take a long, long time to develop. Yeah. It's very, very tricky work, apparently. Yeah, so apparently they're going to approve the fourth dose this week, and I'm going to rush out and be first in line and get it. <laughs> yeah, I think if anybody anybody who's eligible to get it should get it. It's yeah, yeah. certainly not going to do any harm. That's what I figured, yeah. All right. Um, and then, uh, all right, so we're back to me. This one was pretty amazing to me. So Nokia built a bunch of technology for the Russian phone system. And they did it around 2011 and 2012. And the Russian phone system has government intercept. So the government can just spy on everything and they don't need to have a court order or anything. And they just say, you're obeying Russian law. So they built this thing. And now of course, Putin is using it to track down all the people that say nasty things about him and have them poisoned and imprisoned and stuff. And um, Nokia has pulled out and everybody's saying, you rotten bums. This is like reminds you when IBM built the computers in South Africa, which they used to keep track of everybody's race and lock them in their racially zone, restricted zones. And so everyone is saying, Nokia, you rotten bums. And therefore, by the way, Microsoft, you rotten bums, because Microsoft now owns Nokia. And Nokia is making the usual statement like we were obeying Russian law. And they told us they wouldn't do anything bad, but it's kind of clear that they knew bad things were going to happen. And, you know, this is actually a big issue of our age. People are cooperating with China and Saudi Arabia and all these nations are giving them stuff. And we know what they're doing is a violation of American morals. But how can you not obey local law? Anyway, there's a big New York Times article about it and a lot of details. And it's the same old ethical struggle we've had all along. I remember um, uh, Matthew Green had a good point here, though. Um, he wrote a, uh, a famous cryptographer and he wrote a good story about it or a series of tweets. And um, they say other countries make similar demands. And he said, this is um, one thing we need to realize is when we do something like pass the Patriot Act and then start surveilling everybody. Then we erase the moral difference between us and other countries. And now every company that gets used to doing that here, they think it's fine when they have to do that in other nations. So this is something I've heard quite a lot is if we allow civil liberties in America to be eroded, then that's going to lower the standard everywhere. And uh, I think it's a good point. And let me mention this other one here. I've got more than my share of articles today. Um, I, I put my pronouns, he, him, on my Twitter bio about a month ago. I saw people doing this for like years, and I thought, well, that just seems silly. Why should I bother doing that? And then I heard Noam Chomsky, who's about 100, saying, well, you know, who are we about to argue with like trans people if they say how they want us to call them and you should be polite and do it. And I said, well, if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. And a doctor just wrote an article about this. A doctor put her pronouns on her badge at the hospital for about a year. And she said, I'm cis. And she said, the reason I do it is to make so that I do have patients that are transsexual or trans transgender, what's the term? And, and then they'll feel comfortable. I said, well, that's a good point. But she said, now, in the last few weeks, a bunch of people are screaming and yelling at her and getting angry that she has her pronouns on there, which is, of course, because of Tucker Carlson and the other right-wing figures that are uh, pushing anti-trans bills and making it a cultural flashpoint. So the same kind of people that would probably yell at you for wearing a mask will now yell at you for having pronouns on there. But I thought it was a very good thread to see from, you know, I needed someone to explain it to me. You know, if you just grow up and you don't even know there exist transgender people, 
And then people say you need to put your pronouns up when you think it's obvious what gender you are. This is just like what happened to that Supreme Court hearing. When one of the Republicans asked um, Ketanji Jackson, can you tell what, what's a woman? And she wanted her to say, well, it's obvious. Everybody can see what a woman is. And she wouldn't say that because that's no longer true. But all my life, that was assumed to be true. You just look at somebody in one second, you know if they're a woman and you don't need to tell anybody. And uh, it took me a while to understand that, that I probably shouldn't continue to have that attitude. So it's nice to have someone explain it to you. Anyway. All right, and so Caitlin has got AI creating a safer world. That sounds extremely bogus. Well, actually, I think this is the perfect application of AI technology. So, and I'm, I'm, not, being, I'm not being facetious at the moment. <laughs> Anyway, uh, so VentureBeat.com has an article talking about, uh, so it's by uh, Valerius ben ben -Giert, ben -Giert. I butchered that name for sure. Anyway, so- AI anyway. So it might, yeah, it might have been written by AI <laughs> trying to convince us how great AI is. So we'll install it everywhere. Yeah. Who else? <laughs> Yes, uh, it's like it's an episode of Star Trek all over again. It's the giant yeah. AI box, you know, yeah. <laughs> convincing us of how great it is, and we should, you know, make it our leader. Anyway, so yeah. one of the big problems with online content, and especially with Web 2.0, is the fact we have all these people talking and sharing and posting stuff, but moderating it is very difficult. We either have to expose all the users to this content and then hopefully they report it and by the way i've seen hate speech on like twitter and stuff i report it but you know it's kind of blurred in that line between you know like i'm a bigot but i'm like nice about it you know <laughs> like you know and so twitter doesn't do anything about it um and never do anything about it i've seen so many people with egregious violations and twitter never does any it's sort of like right. YouTube. youtube will only cancel us if we tell the truth Right, right. And and so like like Twitter, like I said, if if someone's like a, a giant bigot, it's obvious they're a bigot, but they're not like calling people names. They're just saying things like, Oh, well, this race technically has a lower IQ. And I think oh. I should go on to social media and mention this to everybody. Oh, oh, oh no, it's not like that. There are women with guys threatening to kill them and yeah. doxing them and releasing their phone numbers and they can't get Twitter to take anything down. R right, right. Yes. Yeah, so the other thing too is sometimes it's obscured and it's not entirely you you don't know whether it's part of like um you don't know if the hatred is coming at, at, at the person because of their race or sexual orientation or their their gender um but they'll be like you know women online get harassed a lot more and it's the same kind of harassment that men get but it's just more so how do you quantify that and figure out whether or not that's based on the fact that you know the person is a minority or or it is a woman or you know, they specifically like pissed off a group of people, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, and were jerks themselves, you, you know. So it's really hard to moderate content online. Um, I, and, and right now it's way too lenient, way too many bigots are out there online doing bad things. Mm -hmm. And so AI, I think is a really good application of, of this technology towards moderating content. And that's where we're, where we're going right now. So a bunch of companies are investing money and time to develop AI to automatically detect hate speech and to automatically detect um, rude speech as well. Like not just, not just hate, like, you know, bigotry, but also things that would be considered bullying, right? So if you're going to bully someone, it can automatically detect it and cut it out because this is something no human can do. And there's no simple algorithm to sort of read and understand language. This has to be done with artificial intelligence. And so I'm really glad to see artificial intelligence being used in a way that's actually kind of useful because most artificial intelligence uh, applications have either been complete flops like the self-driving cars <laughs> or they've been interesting at best, you know, like pointing your phone at a flower and having it identify the flower, you know, 90% of the time, you know, that's interesting, but it's, you know, not going to benefit a whole lot of people. This is the first time I've seen AI uh, used to really benefit uh, humanity and benefit the people that use the internet. So that's well, good. I want to push back in the first place, AI 
is spectacularly inefficient and inaccurate. And also it cannot possibly do anything that humans can't do because the only way to train it is to have humans make judgments about thousands of cases and then train the AI on that. Right. And in practice, as we know, it's terrible. YouTube takes our stuff down because it, the AI is stupid. Zoom takes you down. If you mention the word trans, you know, I'm, I, almost all the AI decision-making engines when examined have turned out to be really, really bad. And they're like the first generation of spam blockers where all you have to do is misspell a word to get past them and they block out a whole bunch of good stuff. So, you know, I mean, I think the only point of an AI is that it saves money compared to hiring enough people to do the work, but it does much inferior work. Yeah, we'll see. Hopefully, hopefully it'll catch, catch some more stuff that's getting through because right now way too much, way too much is getting through. And there's really, we really as a society need to come together and create very well-defined standards about behavior because there's large swaths of of our society and as you said in your previous article sam where people are going up to this woman who just says hey my pronouns are she and her and just getting mad at her for that i mean that's well, not acceptable behavior well um i think it's not but i highly doubt that the answer is to have well-defined standards of behavior because then you don't have any freedom to speak. You don't have any art. You don't have any creativity. Now all you've got is just sort of a, uh, a strict bunch of rules. This is what morality degenerates to is like, you know, on the left all my life, I've been around liberal areas where all there is, I remember when Fauci gave his first speech to the AIDS sufferers, he went to, they came to a scientific conference and they were booing and shutting everybody down because all the, at that time, all this research paper said, we studied 100 AIDS victims. And if you can't use the word victim and they were unaware that that was currently the unfashionable word. You know, every, every, every year they change the word. And if you use the wrong word, you get canceled. That's what you tend to get with this strictly rules-based Bayesian morality. Well, when I say, when I say, you know, having standards, you know, ethical standards. I don't mean necessarily, you know, people can't make mistakes, um, but we really need to say very clearly or, or make rules very clearly on every site, you know, that, that's put up um, that, you know, hate speech won't be allowed, um, you oh, know, okay. bullying won't be allowed, you know, things like that, very basic things. I'm not talking about, you know, having this like giant list of, you know, if you accidentally, you know, misgender someone, you're going to jail. You know, that's, that's ridiculous. Oh, but, but. See, but see, this is Facebook's point. What is hate speech? You can't define it. So how can we possibly block it? Uh, well, that, that's where the AI comes in. Because you're not just looking AI at... AI is going to do a better job than well, humans. Well, well, you're not just looking at hate speech. You're also looking at uh, bullying and and just rude speech, things that that yeah. upset people. And that's right. I think you got the point there. And that's what right. the laws they're passing, something that upsets people. So now you have to wait for people to complain and a bunch of people will complain unreasonably. Perhaps. So it's just, it's, I don't think there's going to be a simple answer here. I don't think there's going to be a simple answer, but we, we definitely can't have Nazis going around on our platforms and bigots on our platforms and feeling like there, there's no consequences to that because they, they should get banned if they, you know, go around spreading hate and bullying people and stuff. So, I'm with you there. I think this is yeah. the huge problem of our current age is especially in the world of politics, uh, coordinated and fake behavior and bots and everything have come in to like mess everything up. And we need to somehow filter the harmful stuff online as we learn what it is. Right. And the thing that we now seem to learn just in the last couple of years is that teenage girls in particular suffer greatly online. Right. And so we need to uh, figure out how to prevent that. Right. So I think, you know, we're in the early stages of learning what part of this is harmful and how to block it. Mm -hmm. But I don't think AI is ever going to be leading it. It will always be following behind the humans, doing the most repetitive task that humans are bored doing. But, you know, at least there will be something automated. Yeah. It could hopefully detect some stuff that, you know, you don't necessarily have to wait for a human to get involved every time. Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, and, you know, Facebook is proud of blocking 88% of hate speech. And, uh, you know, that's something. Anyway, all right. So, um, and Alan has got another Facebook investigation. Yes. And this is a really big one. It's from the Reporters Collective, a news organization in India that has done a very in-depth story on Facebook's handling of political advertisements in India. 
And in my opinion, this story is about as big as the uh, Cambridge Analytica story and also the Facebook embedding of a team within the Trump campaign in terms of Facebook's involvement in political elections. And unfortunately, this story has gotten very, very little attention. It's gotten zero attention in the US from what I can tell and uh, practically zero attention in India for that matter. But it's a blockbuster because what they found in looking at the Facebook uh, data, I forget what it's called, but it's the, the database that Facebook makes available to researchers that shows uh, trends in advertising. What they found, these re researchers and, and reporters have found is that Facebook has taken some, has done some things that uh, potentially skewed advertising for political parties in India. And I shouldn't say potentially skewed, it's definitely quantifiably skewed advertising. In particular, there are two major parties that have been advertising on Facebook, Indian parties, the BJP and Congress party. BJP is the ruling party. Uh, the prime minister of India, Narendra Modi, is a member of the BJP. And Facebook has been charging BJP a lower rate for advertising on the platform by 30%. Because 30%, they buy more, lower right? Than Congress. It's a bulk discount, right? They buy more. That's right. But it's a little bit more complicated than that because Congress also pays quite a lot and has bought quite a lot, but uh, BJP buys more. So they get the bulk discount. Mm -hmm. And one might, one might say, oh, well, they're just buying more. So they get the bulk discount. But you have to keep in mind that this, this is political speech. And so it is regulated somewhat differently than say commercial speech or individual speech. India has laws, for example, that regulate who is able to place advertisements on behalf of a candidate, and they're stricter than the US laws. So you cannot have a third party placing ads for a political party candidate. Only that candidate can do that, uh, or their party. So no and PACs like what we have here. Uh, pardon? So no PACs like what we have here, political no, action committees. Yeah. No, okay. no, not legally. And so these, the candidate must explicitly um, permit the, their, the use, their, their endorsement for an ad. But that's not necessarily what happens in Indian Facebook advertising. There are what are called surrogate advertisers, which should not be allowed to advertise according to Indian election law. Um, but the BJP has been using these surrogate advertisers very effectively on the Facebook platform. In fact, the surrogate advertisers have placed more ads than the candidates themselves from the BJP. And Facebook has apparently allowed them to do this. Meanwhile, the Congress party has also attempted to use surrogate advertisers, but much less effectively, only 3000 some ads. And uh, Facebook is much faster in identifying surrogate ads from the Congress party and then shutting those down. So it's, uh, it's the quantity of ads is a, it's an order of magnitude greater from BJP surrogate advertisers than they are for Congress. Facebook has got to know this because after all, they were able to identify and not shut down the Congress advertisers but they appear to be unwilling to do so with the surrogate advertisers from the BJP. It sounds exactly like what's happening here, where the right wingers are far more effective at gaming Facebook. Yes. And uh, and where you have these third party, oh, yeah, so I mean, and therefore they their skillful media manipulation causes them to get more support than their policies would justify. Yes, absolutely. And you know, there's another dimension to this too. One might say, well, Facebook is only interested in money. They're going to do whatever it takes to just make more money. Um, BJP is just a, be a, a better customer, so they'll get the bulk discount, et cetera, et cetera. But we're not talking about a lot of money here. These surrogate advertisers have been placing a lot of ads, and these ads have been displayed uh, billions of times. But Facebook is not getting much money from them, only uh, uh, 58.3 rupees 
or 58.3 million rupees, which comes out to about $761,000. So in terms of money, Facebook, $760,000 is nothing to Facebook. And yet the potential impact to the Indian political system is enormous. Well, you know, if I was running Facebook, I would think the, um, the value in allowing political ads is not the cash you get for it, but the goodwill you get. So when that party ascends to power, you're now the official state favored thing. Uh, and that's an excellent point, Sam, because yeah. uh, Mark Zuckerberg has traveled to India and appeared at uh, events with Narendra Modi. Yeah. And uh, you can find clips of this online. Uh, he's ex effusive in his praise of Modi. If yeah, this is how you make it. You position yourself as part of the winning team. Yes. And so this, this then brings us to another dimension to this whole uh, Facebook and India political situation in that India is actually a bastion for Facebook, a very important part of, of Facebook's um, future success. Yeah, they can't really grow more in the US. They've got to grow in these other nations. That's right. The, in fact, they've been uh, they've started to see negative growth in the US. Yeah. Um, however, in India, Facebook continues to be strong and Instagram and TikTok has had trouble making inroads in India. Yeah. So India is, of course, uh, the most populous nation on Earth. And uh, Facebook is still expanding in India. It, Facebook is still relevant in India, and I can't help but imagine that Facebook sees face, uh, India as essential to their success moving forward. And so if that means having to uh, basically um, play nice with the BJP, which has been in power since 2014, then that's exactly what they're going to do. Yeah, I mean, I see exactly the same thing happening in Florida. Companies that might like to take the moral high ground, say, well, you know, we have to butter up the Republicans because they're going to win. Yeah. And I, I think it's uh, no different here with uh, Facebook and uh, the BJP in India. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I heard a, a, a sociologist wrote a book analyzing why democracy peaked in 2010 and now it's been going down. And now the United States is a broken democracy and many other nations are. And they say that the number one cause of this is the internet. The countries that got broadband internet sooner have democracy fail sooner because of these sort of pressures. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so like we're saying, some, some way of limiting the political harm of social media is a huge issue these days. And it's part of why our government is failing. Yeah, so much for the, the 1990s dreams of an open internet, open society, a panacea yeah. to social ills, citizen journalism, et cetera, et cetera. That is not what has happened, not at all. You know, it seems like it's exactly the same kind of naivete as Adam Smith's invisible hand. If everybody can just go out into the capitalist market and sell, then we'll have the best product at the cheapest price. But what both of these miss is evil conspiracies that game the system. <laughs> yes. I mean, if you if it really was just individual people putting up blogs, then maybe we'd have that utopia. But what it is is evil conspiracies of sending floods of fake profiles. And to be clear, we're talking about real conspiracies here, not yeah. conspiracy theories, but real conspiracies, and they are very real. Yeah, and that's I, yeah. I was going to say the the way you can always tell the difference between conspiracy theories and real conspiracies is that. Uh, real conspiracies um, are very terrible to hide. <laughs> if your conspiracy theory uh, involves people expertly hiding information from the public, it's a conspiracy theory. It's not true. If your conspiracy involves a bunch of people messing up and everyone knowing about what's going on, it's probably true. <laughs> you know, I think you're right because I'm thinking about the conspiracy that's really hurting America is the right wing fake news and stuff. And it's all done in the open. And Donald Trump used to just openly admit everything he's doing. Hey, Russia, how about you hack Hillary? I mean, it's not hidden at all. It's exactly. right in your face. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> all right. And so then we're back to me. And I've got, um, this was something I hadn't thought of. There's a new European privacy law being passed. And this one says, in order to facilitate competition, every 
chat service must interoperate with every other chat service. So if I want to use WhatsApp and you want to use Signal, they should interoperate. And I said, well, that sounds pretty good. And then, of course, the technical people said, wait a minute, that means nobody can use end-to-end -end encryption, or for that matter, strong encryption at all, because the key won't be in the competing company's system. So you're going to lower all the encryption down to zero to do that. And that does seem like a pretty good point. And it kind of reminds me of the, the traditional solution has been, well, then the government should hold all the keys, but that's probably not going to solve the problem either. So uh, they, they've raised an interesting point. Everybody has to be in these walled gardens where all your friends have to join the same social network or you have to give up encryption. I don't see any alternative to one of those two worlds. Anyway, all right. And then uh, Caitlin has got the absolute limit, the end of Moore's law. Yes, the end of Moore's law again. So yeah, yeah. So, yeah News Atlas has an article written by Michael Irving talking about the end, like how fast can we possibly make a computer? And this fascinates me because there's a fundamental limit to how fast that we can make a computer. Oh yeah, sure there is. I've heard this so many times. R right, right. But, but I mean, at least, I mean, the thing is there's, there's a fundamental like limit but of course you can just build it bigger and then yeah you get something faster There's but always a limit to certain kinds of technology under certain conditions right right so un but unless we have a, a new theory of information uh this is this is the limit like the speed of light you know you're not going faster than the speed of light you're not building a computer faster than this and so what did the what did the scientists do well like all good experiments this involves lasers uh, two lasers, in fact, so it's like double a good experiment. Yeah, they hit a uh, atom that was acting like a transistor, a uh, semiconductor, uh, with a high-powered short pulse laser. And then they hit it with another laser shortly afterwards to get the current moving. Uh, so the first laser, laser bumps the atom up to a higher energy level. Second la laser gets a current going. Uh, they mess with the current, and they keep making the laser go shorter and shorter and shorter. Now it turns out that the Heisenberg uncertainty principle comes into play at this point. So uh, normally we think of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle talking about location and um, uh, like and speed. You know, like the, if you if you know the 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 speed of a particle, it lets you know about its location and vice versa. Uh, well, the same is true with um, uh, with energy levels and like how pinpoint you you change energy levels. So they had a laser be very short, a very short pulse. Um, and so they can time the atom, the electrons uh, jump very precisely. But because you can do that, the amount of energy transferred to the electron becomes extremely uncertain. Uh, so it, it starts to break down when the laser pulses get to a certain point. And what's that point? What is the point? What, how fast can we make our computers? It turns out about one petahertz, which is about a million gigahertz. Right. Um, after that, you know, you, if you try to clock this computer faster, uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle comes into play and you really can't get the electrons knowing exactly what the hell's going on. Yes, uh, but that assumes you're using electrons. In yes. semiconductors. Right, right. So this is all for optical and electrical equipment. Yeah. Well, uh, that's why I thought it was funny. I read this. That's the limit. A million, a million gigahertz, which is not an immediate problem. But anyway, that's the limit of semiconductors. Right. All you have to do is move into nuclei, which we're already doing. Mm -hmm. And they're like 10 to the five times smaller. So, you know, it's the same as it always is. You reach the limit of one technology, you go to a different technology. Right, right. So thank you, Sam. That, that was a good point. So this is the limit of optical uh, electrical components. Yeah, yeah. Which, no. by yeah. the way, is pretty far ahead. A million yes. gigahertz, I think you could charge some money for that and people would buy it. Yeah. And like I said, you can always scale up. So you, you get this uh, pentahertz processor and then yeah. you just add more cores and, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, 640K should be enough for anyone. Yes. Yeah. All right. Yep. Anyway. Um, all right, and then uh, we've got fertilizer panic from Alan. <laughs> yeah, this is a follow-up to last week when I was talking about fertilizer and how the price of fertilizer is going up and it's gloom and doom and this is going to be huge problems for the wheat supply, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, turns out the story may be a little bit more complicated than that. And I, I say this 
thanks to Dr. Sarah Tabor, who is a um, a fertilizer expert. <laughs> well, she's not a fertilizer expert. She is like a a crop scientist. Um, that sounds like a fertilizer expert to me. Yeah, which is about as close as you can get to being a fertilizer uh, expert, I suppose. Yes. And she makes some really interesting points here that you're not going to see in perhaps more of the mainstream reporting on the fertilizer price situation. And well, this is great. The, way, the top secret information, the lamestream news is hiding from us. YouTube is going to love us now. <laughs> That's right. We're talking about a real conspiracy here, folks. There you go. The internet loves us now. Yeah. Um, the, the price of fertilizer, and there, there's three different uh, important, important uh, fertilizers out there, nitrogen, phosphorus, and uh, something else that escapes me at the moment. The prices on each have, have gone up significantly. Um, but uh, Sarah Tabor breaks this down in a really interesting way about nitrogen in particular. And first of all, she makes the point that it's really hard to know what's actually happening in terms of global trade of fertilizer because those statistics are not publicly available for the most part. Uh, in order to get this, you have to pay uh, something like $500 to one of these you know, research platforms so that you can find out what's actually happening inside the global fertilizer trade market. So this is uh, simply inaccessible to crop scientists like her or to uh, most journalists. So it's a global conspiracy of the fertilizer cartel. Yes, that's right. And then she goes on to make a number of observations about nitrogen specifically, which is apparently um, uh, manufactured, if you will, using the Haber-Bosch process. Um, and so what you really need is the atmosphere, high temperatures, high pressure, and a lot of methane to do that. And you get methane from oil uh, or the oil extraction processes. And so there are some countries that have a lot of oil and can make nitrogen very easily. And those countries are Russia, the US, and Trinidad and Tobago, which is probably not on anybody's top 10 list of major manufacturing countries, but Trinidad and Tobago is right next door, right off the coast of Venezuela. And Venezuela is a huge oil producer. And so they can get all the cheap methane they need from yeah. Venezuela. And I think the Biden administration has in fact been going to Venezuela to try to get oil lately. Yes, that's right. That's right. And I don't know if Venezuela is going to play along with the US administration. But I, I don't know if Trinidad and Tobago has actually been covered by any of those sanctions. Mm -hmm. because They're a separate country after all. Yeah. Um, but what has been going on in Trinidad and Tobago is that starting at the beginning of the pandemic, in uh, March 2020, Trinidad and Tobago basically shut down a lot of their nitrogen production. Um, and so they have, uh, and it's still shut down much of it. So they have a lot of excess capacity that they could basically turn right back on and they could start cranking out more nitrogen fertilizer in very short order if the demand is there. And mm -hmm. it looks like they are starting to ramp up now. Um, but this brings up the issue of, well, why are the prices going up so much if there is in fact so much excess capacity in the global system? And indeed it does appear that there is some uh, excess capacity in the global system. And this is where we, we don't really know. There are a lot of mysteries in the workings of the global fertilizer industry apparently. Um, and I, I don't think uh, Sarah Tabor has any clear answers to this either. So it's far more mysterious. This fertilizer shortage and the huge run-up in fertilizer prices is far more mysterious and complex than just saying war in Ukraine. Well, you know, I'm, I'm watching the oil prices and the ruble. And like yesterday, Russia said, well, we're going to only take part of Ukraine, not the whole thing. And so the ruble went back over above a penny and it's... And obviously Putin is lying. He's obviously just going to move in more troops and attack again. And it's just amazing how the tiniest motion politically leads to huge swings in prices, as everybody guesses. It reminds me of meme stocks. I think the stock market is an amplifier of rumors, like Facebook. 
Yeah, for all the talk about the stock market being a perfectly efficient market that prices in all information, that is very clearly not true. It might be true maybe in the long term, but the this is why you have um, day traders. The short-term swings are just nuts and based yes. on nothing. Yeah, but extremely difficult to predict. Yep, everybody has a system, but it seems to work about as well as any other gambler with a system. Yeah, otherwise, all those day traders from the late 90s, early 2000s, but during the dot-com boom would still be going strong. Yeah, I'm glad when I hear people that know about this, like Scott Galloway, say, you know, the best thing you could do is buy a few good stocks and just sit on them for 20 years, because that's the part where you don't have to work hard. I like that part. <laughs> yes, I worked fine for Apple and Amazon. So Yeah. And, and I've got, um, anyway, the last one, when I saw this morning, um, Facebook's African sweatshops trying to stop the hate speech. They, what Facebook has done is it has contracted that work to various other countries where they have local workers. And in Africa, um, they have hired people. They're paying them like $1 or $2 an hour. They are lying to them about what they're going to do. They tell them they're going to be like answering phones or something. But when they get in, what they're going to be doing is watching God awful, horrible Facebook posts of people being beheaded and every kind of horrible thing, and forced to watch like many of these per hour, deciding within 50 seconds whether each one should be canned or not, and then having a second person test it and then punish you if you don't maintain like an 85% accuracy. And they lied to them about giving them breaks, they lied to them about giving them mental counseling, uh, they lied to them about vacations and stuff. And so they had a huge expose of Facebook, how they just, and when they asked Facebook, Facebook said, oh no, we maintain the highest ethical standards and our workers are treated right. Uh, that's those local people that do those bad things, but they told us they're not doing any of that. So we have outsourced the responsibility in our view, and we're not responsible for the mistreatment those people are getting. Facebook's not responsible and local people feel like, well, we're paying them more than is the typical salary in our nation. So that's good enough. And so there's huge, and then the guy tried to form a union, so they fired him and everybody around him. Um, so anyway, uh, they have this big article in Time exposing all this, and the author of this article, um, Billy Perigo, just put on Twitter that because of his article, there's now a huge lawsuit against Facebook and against this company and uh, demanding better treatment and all sorts of things. So this may actually help. We'll see, but this is... Uh, this is the good part of what Caitlin was saying a while ago. It would be better if AI was doing this. But right now, it seems to be humans viewing all the most horrible stuff on Earth to stop us all from having to see it and suffering greatly as a consequence. So maybe there'll be, I'm hearing a lot of this, you know, Amazon and Starbucks and everybody. For like 30 years, I've wondered, why aren't there any tech unions? And they're coming. I hope. We certainly need tech unions. Tech workers are being abused in many ways. And uh, all the big companies are responding the way they always do by just trying to crush anyone who dares to make a union. But uh, it's looking like we come to the end of that road. Anyway, I think that's it for this one. And we'll be back on Friday. <laughs>